Chapter 19 Petra the Mysterious When Palestine came under British rule after the First World War, the area beyond the Jordan and east of the Dead Sea was given to Prince Abdullah, son of King Hussein of Mecca, who had rendered great services by leading the Arab revolt against the Turks. Emir Abdullah named his new country Transjordan, beyond the Jordan, and here in this land of Gad and Reuben, he ruled from Amman the unruly Bedouin tribes who live in the ancient line of march of the Israelites from Egypt into Canaan. Britain gave up her mandate of Palestine after World War II, and the Jordan Arab Legion, under the Britisher Glub Pasha, Arabia's most effective army, struck across the Jordan. At the head of the Legion and volunteer auxiliaries was Abdullah. Ancient Jerusalem, city sacred to Jew, Christian and Muslim, fell once more into Arab hands. From the purely Arab point of view, it was unfortunate that the Muslim holy place, the Dome of the Rock, should have been so easily won. This meant that quite a number of the Muslim fighters felt that, in regaining control of the Dome, they really had no war aims to accomplish. This, anyway, was what many Jordanians told me. If Jerusalem had been further westward, we would have fought our way to the Mediterranean. In a symbolic gesture, the Christian and Muslim Arabs of the city handed Abdullah the keys of Jerusalem. Hail, King of the Jordan! Today, as I walked in the colourful streets of Amman, the rock-girt desert capital, these thoughts crowded into my mind. There, with the dazzlingly white ramparts of the royal palace perched high upon the mountain above me, a new, young monarch, Talal, son of Abdullah, ruled. But where his father had looked down thirty years ago upon a huge, deserted, ancient Roman amphitheatre and precious little else, he could today see not only a truly Arab city, but the emergence of a progressive state. There is still no lack of hawk-faced Bedouin nomads proudly stalking the myriad bazaars, and while quite a number of desert chieftains drive modern limousines, they will never use them in the desert, whose sun-baked sand had always struck me as ideal for motor transport. Insults to the noble camel, they snort when you ask them why. Modern shops rub shoulders with seemingly prehistoric potteries, while over yonder is the immense crisscrossing of runways for the new aerodrome. These things, like the central heating, for the desert night is fiercely cold, have come to stay. Romance and colour, dashing young officers of the Arab Legion, camel caravans and strange exotic music make up the pattern of today's Amman life. Amman is absorbing, but two cities beckoned with their greater mystery. In one place, a single signpost with twin arrows summarised my route. One said simply, Petra, the other, Jerusalem the Holy. I had seen each country, almost every monument of the Middle East. Nothing, though, can approach the strange fascination of these two places, one dead yet almost throbbing with a nearly occult allure, the other cradle of Western civilization. And so I went first to Petra. For two hours my car jolted southwards, through a desert wilderness whose monotony was broken only by weird, wind-eroded boulders, or an occasionally heavily armed Bedouin frowning his disapproval from the proud eminence of a milk-white racing camel for this noisy, clearly inferior machine. Within five miles of Petra, the hidden city, the going becomes too rough for cars. I hired a mount from the horse dealers who have learnt to wait here in the knowledge that mechanically propelled creations of the evil one chug to a halt at this point. Plodding uphill among boulder-strewn defiles, immense, starkly naked rocks of strange shapes rise in violent contrast to the smooth green verdure now appearing in the valleys. We entered Wadi Musa, the Valley of Moses, where tradition relates that Moses struck the rock and a spring flowed forth. Camel patrols of the Legion pass ceaselessly here, guarding the western Jordan frontier in the biblical land of Edom. 
Under the blazing noonday sun, the effect is most impressive. The intermingling reds, blues and greens of the rocks, a white foaming brook, the tough bearded legionaries in Arab headdress. Thus may this land have looked at almost any time during the past 4,000 years. On twisting through the two-hour labyrinth between the mountain of Seir, we came upon groups of small brown and white hillocks. These are the reputed tombs of the guardians of Petra, the invulnerable city. Then, as though split by some gigantic chisel, a jagged cleft in the towering cliffs shows the only path through which the rock-hewn city can be entered. Amazing though it may seem, Petra is invisible until you are almost upon it. Wall upon wall of native stone, rampart after rampart rises in seeming chaos. Allah laughed when he threw these mountains down here, chuckled my Bedouin guide. Yet beyond these towering walls, through the single cleft called the Sikh, lies the wondrous Nabatean city. This is Petra. Inside the grim mountain mass, as though the centre has been scooped out, lies a valley actually 15 square miles in area. On every side of this hidden depression, magnificent facades have been hewn over a period of centuries. Immense colonnaded cloisters, vast pillared halls, arched and arcaded treasuries, audience halls, temples and a hundred other edifices loom like a fairy city. Yet the only entrance to this wonderland is that narrow split between the mountains, and every single building has been carved out by hand in situ, in a variety of styles, of which the predominant motifs are classical Greek. Add to all this the fact that the rocks are of every shade of red, and the facades of gargantuan size, and you will have some idea of the breathtaking glory of the dead, but somehow almost living, city of Petra. What is its story? As in many other things, the Bible tells us something of it. When Jacob, expelling the Horites from their rocky fastnesses, gave Esau his chance to come here, the people were known after this as Edomites. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Obadiah verse 3. It was the Edomites, the ancient patrons, who refused the Israelites' passage when they returned this way from the Egyptian captivity. It is believed that thirst came upon the Israelites near Petra, and Moses struck the rock here, hence the Valley of Moses. This stream still runs, and is still believed by the local people to possess miraculous properties. The Edomites and Israelites never became harmonized. Extending their sway up to the Jordan River, the men of Edom were in their turn replaced by the Nabataeans, a highly cultured Arab tribe. Divided into two sections, soldiers and merchants, they traded, it is said, with distant China, and their inscriptions have been found as far afield as Italy. Fighting the Romans for centuries, it was only in AD 106 that they were overcome. From that date they disappeared and history is mute about Petra until the Crusaders came and built here their church, the only building not hewn from the rocks. As I rode into the secret city, I noticed that the narrow stone walls on either side of the cleft were worn smooth by erosion or human passage through past uncounted centuries. The oblique sunlight strikes reddish-brown against the rocks. From here there is a sheer drop of nearly 700 feet. Easy to defend, it is almost impossible to conceive how this place could have been taken in war. Treachery seems the answer. As my horse picked his way gingerly along the ledge, a whispering echo of the wind was all that broke into my silent reflections. After a mile of this comes the first and most gorgeous facade of all, the treasury which marks the beginning of the valley. The blazing sun's rays, pouring into the now open cup-shaped valley, heightens a glowing illusion of red hotness over the whole area. Within the massive portals, like other Petra chambers, 
There is nothing now to relieve the vast emptiness of the interior. No furniture, nothing but all-pervading solitude in what was once the centre of a mighty empire. Local legend says, however, that the Nabataean merchant princes, each with five to ten hundred slaves, lay upon costly inlaid ivory divans, gold and silver were their platters, even of the lesser people, the rich carpets lay seven deep upon the floors. The soldiers, though, seemed to have lived a more austere life than that. I went into one guardhouse at the entrance of the treasury. Across the centre of the room was a wide stone table, flanked by narrow, smooth, rock-hewn benches. The Nabataeans must have been small people, for I found it uncomfortable to fit myself between the seat and the table. Beyond this the valley opens out. On the right and left lie tombs and halls, one the great hall of audience of the ancient kings, each one decorated outside with intricate carving, statues and columns. The detail still remains, every inch a monument to man's creative skill. Literally hundreds of tombs, altars and sacrificial places are cut in the variegated rose-red and terracotta rocks. Inside, as outside, the veins of green, red, yellow and blue sandstone give a gorgeous effect, a warm reaction of almost physical well-being, akin to the enjoyment of inlaid precious stones. And when the night falls and the moon rides the skies and this fairy city is bathed in her silvery light, there is such a blending of subtle colour on the faces of the rock temples, contrasting with the massive solidity of the carving as to beggar description. Two thousand years and more seemed to roll back as I trod this strange place, and the imagination conjured up living scenes in every wonder the long-robed priests of the sun-god Dushara at the altar of sacrifice, the golden-helmeted officers of the imperial guard, the hoard of priceless gems still locally believed to be hidden in the huge but inaccessible stone urn surmounting the treasury. The oddest thing about those civilised savages who must have been the Nabataeans of Pedra was their eagerness to adopt anything and everything from those with whom they came in contact. They worshipped the stellar gods of their Arab ancestors, looted and traded far and wide to bring both wealth and architectural ideas to their bandit kingdom. Even when the Emperor Trajan finally gained the city for Rome, the Petrans avidly copied his architecture for their rock palaces. Even the Roman conquest did not finish Petra. A vast amphitheatre was hewn out of the rock, and life must have gone on very much as before the guardians of this strategic point continuing to levy tribute upon the luckless caravans wending their way to Mecca and South Arabia. But the drift of trade and economy strangled the robber fortress. To my mind it should be considered one of the wonders of the world. I doubt if anyone could even glimpse that seventy-foot high cleft which is the entrance without feeling a thrill of regret that this civilization should have passed away but such is human restlessness that I retraced my steps towards Amman, for the lure of that other goal was now tugging at my thoughts. Jerusalem, the holy. <laughs>